Norman Mailer, author of Oswald's Tale, an American Mystery. Did you ever know Jack Kennedy? Oh, yeah. Not well, but I, I met him a few times. And, in fact, I was covering him on, uh, <coughs> excuse me, covering him in, uh, uh, before the 1960 election for Esquire. I'd, I'd covered the convention, and then uh, uh, someone got me an interview with him at Hyannisport. So it was funny, because I came in with two, uh, two prepared pieces that I was going to throw at him, and I did. And one of them was that the Village Voice had had a, um, uh, they'd had a poll on would you vote for, who would you vote for. And one fellow had said, um, well, as between uh, Kennedy and Nixon, Kennedy is a zero and Nixon's a minus, so I'll vote for Kennedy. And the other, I forget who it was, um, I think, it, well, I don't remember who it was, I won't say, uh, went in for something on the order of the Democrats were running an ad that showed Richard Nixon with a very heavy beard. And... Um, they said underneath it, would you buy a used, would you trust this man, would you buy a used car from this man? And uh, then it went on to say, however, if you bought the car from Jack Kennedy, you would trust him, and you would buy the car, and then after you bought the car, he'd come, drop by to visit to see how it was working, and he'd seduce your wife. So Kennedy was absolutely shocked by that one, because after all, this was 1960, you didn't uh, approach presidents that way. And so he said, well, the first one's kind of, kind of absurd, you know. I mean, after all, it's the difference between a zero and a minus. I mean, I just really don't think of myself as a zero. And I'm sure, Richard Nixon doesn't think of himself as a minus. And he went on a little. He said, in the second one, well, I, I really don't know what that means. And, well, he, it was one of the few times he'd ever been rattled, I think. Uh, it was sort of cheeky what I was doing, after all. And uh, as we were going outside, he did something. Looking back on it, it was so clever because I'd thrown him. And he said, who is this guy? What is he up to? And... He made another mistake. He said, what kind of car do you drive? He said, no, let me, let me guess. It's a Volkswagen, right? I said, no, it's a Triumph, TR3. So now I had him twice, I thought. And the last thing he said is, come back tomorrow. We'll do another interview and bring anyone you want. So I uh, made the mistake of um, inviting my wife. And the moment I did, he knew more about me than I knew about him, which is this poor fellow has got to bring his wife along to impress her. Whereas if I'd brought Arthur Schlesinger or someone of that ilk, he would have known that he was dealing with a formidable character. So the second interview was all his. It, uh, he controlled it. He was very skillful. He was charming. Uh, he was perfect. But those were the uh, two times I met him. But I, I didn't know a lot of people who knew him, so I kept hearing stories about him. And like all uh, presidents who know you very slightly, they make a political point of passing messages on like uh, liked your last piece very much or <laughs> stuff of that sort you would have been younger than him well yes i was about three four years younger i'm 72 now we have to reconstruct it that was 35 years ago so i was 37. what did you think and he of was him? 41. did you vote for him oh yeah oh yeah no no he um i was very impressed with him he had um he had for one thing i realized that he was a man of many faces because i saw him over these two days and I saw at least four or five faces on him. By the way, that's not uncommon for politicians. I once covered Maggie Thatcher, and she had three or four faces, and they were all remarkable. She could look like um, uh, Queen Elizabeth of the 16th century uh, at one moment, and she could look like, uh, if she was passing through a mill with a lot of British housewives doing mill work, she would tie a scarf around her head and look like one of them. If she spoke to uh, some Edinburgh gentry, she'd look like um, uh, a woman of that country just off her horse. Uh, she, she really had a lot of faces. And uh, he had the same quality, Kennedy. He, uh, at one point, he, uh, he looked like a professor. He, he was comfortable. He looked like a man of 45, even of 50. He was gray at the edges. He had a gentle intellectual face. Uh, ten minutes later, he could look like a movie star under the sun, uh, speaking into, uh, to a press conference. Uh, his face kept changing. Uh, he could be like an older brother, kind of riding you, jibing you. You, you. The moment we were outside looking at the car was kind of remarkable to me because he was saying, what kind of car are you driving? And I, I bet I can guess. And it was, uh, he, he was kind of like a big guy, a uh, kid and a little guy. Uh, so he, ha he had these sides. And, uh, Where were you the day he was shot? You know, I've been asked that. It's funny. It, it's the one question I've been asked three or four times on this tour. I guess it's natural. It's an um, organic question. But it's an embarrassing question for me because it's one of my, my least, um, what can I say, my least commendatory moments. 
Uh, I was in a restaurant with Norm Pedaritz, who used to be a great friend in the old days, uh, on the lower, on the Middle East side, uh, East 50s in Manhattan, and there was someone else there, I forget who, and uh, Jack Thompson was his name, that's who, and uh, there was, uh, the news came in, and I was very cynical, I was bitter at Kennedy at that point, for whatever reason, and I said, uh, oh, you know, that, that shot just singed his scalp, he's not really hurt. Uh, he's just letting us all wait for an hour or two so we realize we love him and need him. But in fact, there's nothing going on. And, uh, of course, an hour later he was dead, and uh, I realized that I had a great deal to learn about a great many things. You know, you learn that over and over and over again, but that day I learned it dramatically. Do you have any memory at all why you were mad at him at that time? Well, I'd have to, again, I'd have to reconstruct it. Uh, who knows, it was some little thing probably, because after all, the Bay of Pigs was two years before that. It, it, it could have been for a variety of reasons, including petty reasons. Maybe it was because he'd never invited me to the White House. Uh, I don't pretend to be any better than the next fellow. This book, Norman Mailer's Oswald's Tale, an American Mystery, if somebody buys this, what do they get in here? Well, uh, you know, I like to give a lot of value for the dollar, so <laughs> they're going to get a good bid. But uh, if you ask me to sell my own book, all right, I'll try to do that. Uh, they're going to get a, first of all, they're going to get a, an informal biography of Lee Harvey Oswald, which starts in the middle. The first half is about him at the age of 19 going into Russia and leaving Russia at the age of 22. That's the first half of the book. And it's got a lot of new material about Oswald in Russia, living in Minsk, getting married, having children there, uh, uh, trying to get along in the Soviet system, becoming disillusioned, and a lot of detail on how he got out because he used his wits. He was very uh, resourceful in getting out of the Soviet Union. Uh, he had to fight the Russian bureaucracy and the American State Department bureaucracy. And he finally ended up making it so uncomfortable and so unpleasant for each bureaucracy that each one said, let's get rid of this problem. I mean, finally, the only way to solve certain impasses with a bureaucracy is that you become so intolerable that the people in the bureaucracy say, isn't there some way we can pass this indigestible morsel through our system? And he succeeded in doing that in both places. Uh, people always thought it was very mysterious that he got out and came back, but in fact it wasn't. He just wore out two bureaucracies. All right, then he came back to the United States, and uh, the second half of the book is all about Oswald in America, starting with him as a child and carrying him through to uh, the day of the assassination. And uh, in it, what the book became for me as I wrote it was a, was a portrait of the Cold War as seen by somebody who's living at the bottom in both countries. And uh, the Cold War then becomes a tragic comedy because there was no war necessary not even a Cold War necessary, in that the Russians that you meet in this book are about like Americans. They're different in very specific ways, but they're very much the same, and uh, maybe a little warmer, because one thing that does characterize Russians, I think because their history has been so god-awful, is that possibly the first virtue for Russians is compassion, because everything in the scheme of life, in, in Russian life over the last century, has been to one catastrophe after another, tends to tighten people up, tends to chill them, tends to close them down so that they become impervious to feeling. And so for Russians, someone who can respond sympathetically to your troubles is a person of inestimable value. And over and over and over again, what you find when people are talking about Oswald, people would say, I pitied him. He was so lonely. He was here without a family. And uh, you know, the, the, uh, what came through also was the extraordinary Russian sense of family, which is very powerful. We'll go back to the, the first time this book was even a possibility for you. Who started it? This book started with Lawrence Schiller, uh, as the Executionist song did. Uh, you know, the book I wrote about Gary Gilmore. Schiller. Lawrence Schiller. Uh, Larry had worked in, uh, in the Soviet Union from off and on from about 1983 on because he was directing Peter the Great, the movie Peter the Great that was put on in television in a, a miniseries. Uh, with Maximilian Schill a couple of years later. And so he had contacts in the Soviet Union, and he learned how to work with the bureaucracy there. And at a given moment, when the Soviet Union started to fall apart, and everything began to open up, and it looked like some of the KGB files were going to uh, indeed open up, uh, he called me one day and said, listen, would you be interested in doing a book about Oswald in Russia, because I think I'm going to have access to the Oswald file. So it came at a perfect time for me. I'd finished Harlot's Ghost, which some people may remember that at the end of page 1300, I'd said, to be continued. 
So the second half had to do with the narrative being in Russian. And I was wondering, how am I going to really deal with the KGB? I don't know enough about the KGB. I've got to learn more. This was the perfect opportunity. Uh, and also, I'd been obsessed with Oswald for more than 30 years. Uh, you know, had he done it? Hadn't he done it? Was he part of a conspiracy? So uh, I, I said yes without any great palaver back and forth. And in September... Um, what year now? This would be 92. September 92, moved over to Minsk. And um, Larry and I worked together with a <coughs> young lady, a translator named Ludmila, whom he, um, the period of time, married and divorced. After, after divorced after we left Russia. Who did? Larry. Met and divorced? No, he didn't meet her. He'd known her for years. Oh. But, but he married her while we were still in Russia, in Minsk, not Belarus. And then they got divorced later. The, the point of that is not that they got married and divorced, but that the three of us uh, were there all the time working in Minsk where there's nothing to do except eat a, an indifferent meal in an unhappy restaurant every night. Because Minsk is, will never be famous for its cuisine or at least not in the next decade or two, and, uh, and work. And we worked. We worked constantly. We interviewed people. Uh, we had the great good fortune that the KGB had shut down uh, all talk about Oswald after the assassination because they were horrified by it. They got paranoid. They felt that the United States had a master plan to start a war with them and that Oswald was the, uh, w w w was the point of this war. And so they immediately went, in Minsk, they immediately went around to everyone who had known Oswald and said, don't say a word about him. And nobody did. So for 30 years, no one had talked about Oswald. You can imagine what a time capsule we entered when we started interviewing people who had known him and were his friends. Now, where did you live in Minsk? Well, I lived in a, um, an apartment house that was like every other apartment house in Minsk. There's no differentiation as such. You know, in other words, you can be a worker, you can be a doctor, you can be a professor, you can be a manicurist. Everyone lives at the same level, which is a fairly low level. I had a small three-room apartment, which was pretty good, uh, in a dreary quarter, which was like all the other dreary quarters in, in Minsk. The difference is that um, in Minsk is, is that if you were an intellectual, you lived no better, or you were a doctor or a scientist, you lived no better unless you were very, very high than a worker. In fact, you may have even earned less money a month. But what you did have is you had your superiority, which is you had your essential class superiority, which is you were cultured and they were not. And I found this out because one day I was living in a workers' quarter, and the only way I knew I was living in a workers' quarter was that every Friday and Saturday night there'd be a bunch of kids, 17 and 18 years old, who'd be getting drunk on the entrance to this dingy apartment house. And when I'd come back, I was always driven up in a little car with a driver. I'd get out, and they'd offer me homebrew vodka. And I happened to be on the wagon at that time, because I thought if I start drinking in Minsk, I'll never stop. So I was on the wagon for those six months. And so I'd go, no, 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 and I'd point to my stomach or make some joke, and then I'd say, yeah, Amerikansky. And then they'd all go, ha, 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 and I'd go, ha, 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 and then I'd walk into my apartment. And it was, you know, they were, they were tough, but they were kind of jovial in a funny way, and it was, I was just a curiosity. You know, who's this old gink who's an American who's living among us? And since I couldn't speak my, more than about 10 or 20 words of Russian, uh, uh, I couldn't learn it. I tried. It was, you know, I, 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 if I were to sort to cry with frustration, I would have cried over the way I couldn't learn Russian. But I couldn't. And uh, so that was all of it. And then one day, a woman that we were interviewing came by in the same car. She was picked up first, and the driver picked me up. And we were going to the place, to the hotel where she'd be interviewed. And I said to her, uh, tell me about the neighborhood I live in. And so she said, oh, it's a worker's quarter. And she said, I was very shocked when I found you there. Now, the reason she was shocked is I was a writer, and uh, Larry Schiller had done his best to indicate to everyone there that I was an immensely esteemed writer, that an incredibly esteemed writer from America had come to live among them, <coughs> which I must say it was a boon, because I certainly couldn't do that for myself. And uh, the uh, woman had heard that, and so here is this, um, <clears throat> here's this esteemed writer living in a low quarter. Well, I can tell you my apartment house was just as good as any other apartment house in town, but it was just you didn't live with workers. So you had this incredible snobbery, this incredible class system, but equal, equal economic life. It was very odd. It was the way people have to uh, find a, a, a social superiority, no matter how. And uh, uh, she just couldn't... The only reason it was a workers' quarter 
was that their, this apartment house was near a factory where all those people worked. So they would get, when they got an apartment, they would get one in this apartment house since it was near the factory. What months of, and what year were you li actually living there? Well, I was there, I was there from September 92 to uh, February 93, not constantly. I'd, I'd come back to America. I have a family here after all. So I'd come back about every three or four weeks. I'd come back for a few days. I lived with jet lag. It's not eight hours difference, so it's quite a jet lag. You start off by talking about Marina Oswald. Yes. Um, why did you begin with her? Well, I began with her aunt, actually, who had an extraordinary experience during the war. And I thought that would set the stage. Uh, uh, her aunt, Valya, is a wonderful woman, sort of salt of the earth, and, and uh, had gone through these incredible experiences and had this odd, sweet, positive attitude. And Marina was, was more complex than her aunt and more, I wouldn't say disturbed, I don't like that word, it's unfair, it's pejorative, but she had been twisted by life more. She was angrier, she was more complicated, she had many more things bothering her. And the book begins with Anne Valya, who grows up, has a husband, loves him, lives in Minsk, and then comes this niece from Leningrad who's troubled. And so that's how the book begins, and then at the end of this first long chapter, about 30 pages, the niece Marina comes home one night and uh, turns to the aunt and says, Valya, get up, get dressed. I brought an American home. Make some coffee, show some culture. <laughs> and so Valya gets up and learns that this nice young American who's very neat has come, and his name is Lee Harvey Oswald. So that's how the book begins. And how, did you, is the aunt still alive? Oh yeah, very much. And did all these folks talk to you? Sit down and you interviewed them? Yeah. You and Larry Schiller together? Oh, yeah, always. With the translator, which made for, um, um, I've told this before, but it's worth telling again. It, we had great frustration because Larry and I, having done the execution of the song, used to be able to interview, sometimes we interview four or five people in a day. It was really, we really got an awful lot done. Let me it, interrupt just to have you tell us, for those that have not read it, what's the executioner's song? It, it's a book I wrote about Gary Gilmore. It's the same sort of book, very roughly in that it consisted of interviewing a great many people and then writing a book based on the interviews. And Gary Gilmer was? He was the man who uh, killed two people in Utah and then uh, demanded that he, he was given the death penalty and he demanded that he be executed. And what year was this? Well, you have me there. It was 1977, 78, right in there. And your book was a bestseller back then? Yes. No. Okay, then now let's go to this one. Uh... Well, oh, excuse me, I have to cough. Well, uh, the problem was that we had, we'd be interviewing a Russian, so we needed one hour for the English, one hour for the Russian, and one hour for arguing with our translator. Of course, she used to have a very definite idea of how you spoke. And I began to learn a lot about Soviet society, which was just ending at that point, by her attitudes. For instance, we might ask a question on the order of, uh, what year was it that your father was in the gulag? Since this had come up earlier in the conversation, in a roundabout way. And she said, I will not ask that question. It will wreck the interview. You will insult them by such a question. They will not be able to go on. So we'd say, well, ask the question the way you want to ask it. So she'd ask the question, and she'd get an answer. And then we'd turn and say, what did you ask them? And she'd say, I said to them, was there a year which was worse for your family than other years. And through that, you began to get a sense of how roundabout everything was in, in the old Soviet Union. That, that people became not evasive, but they phrased questions in such a way that there were no sharp edges, uh, there was no handle to the conversation, so they could not be repeated definitively afterward in such a way as to incriminate you. And uh, it opened a great deal because uh, you had that contrast between the essential brusque approach of Russians. You know, it's a, it, it, I don't know the finesse in Russian, there's a great deal of it apparently, but immediately in the, in the little bit you can learn, there's a great deal of brusque approach. Uh, you, you, you know, it's, it's, it, there, there, are no, there are no definite articles, there are no indefinite articles. And you wrote that way a lot in the beginning of this. To get the, the quality of it, yeah. Um, how many people would you say you sat down and talked to in Minsk? Well, also in Moscow, because we interviewed a good many people in Moscow as well. Altogether, I think we must have interviewed, I had to guess, 60 people, 50 or 60. But they were in depth. It was different. The execution of the song, we must have interviewed 300 people. But 
here, first of all, the number of people were limited. Not everyone had known Oswald well enough to bear an interview. And the other was it took so long. You really had to work very slowly and carefully. And then we, but we interviewed in depth. There were certain people we saw ten times, ten interviews. And, uh, by the way, how, how had he gotten to Minsk? Well, the way he got to Minsk was uh, by way of Moscow. He arrived in Moscow as a tourist on a deluxe ticket. And in those days, there, there was always a great mystery made about how he got there, but I think that mystery was ex over-exaggerated. Because, in fact, in those days, if you were landed in Finland and you were willing to buy a deluxe ticket to get into uh, Moscow, the uh, Russian embassy in, in Finland would send you on quickly. They liked the idea of tourists coming and giving dollars and, and moving in. So he landed in, in Moscow. He announced on the first or second day he was there to his in-tourist guide, whose name was Rima, that he wished to become a Soviet citizen. He wanted to give up his American citizenship and become a Soviet citizen. And she was very taken with this. She was intensely patriotic, as most young and tourist girls were in those days. And uh, she loved the idea. She said she would help him. Well, of course, they quickly got nowhere. And after, on the fifth day, when he was told he'd have to go home, and they weren't, nobody was going to take him, because for the Russians, this was extremely odd and unpleasant that, you know, the KGB was immediately brought in, of course, and their answer is, who is this man? Uh, why is he coming? He's an ex-Marine, and he wants to live among us. There's something wrong here. Now, in the beginning, I didn't believe that they'd be that indifferent and that cautious. But as I got to know them, what you came to understand is that in Russia, the key thing was not to make a mistake. You know, if you're going to do your job, do it in such a way that you make no serious mistakes and slowly you'll get promoted over the years. Don't do anything bold because it can get you in terrible trouble. It can boomerang. They had the memory of all the Stalin years, after all. You just never wanted to be uh, uh, someone who could be noticed. And so the idea that someone's going to give him permission to stay in the country or give him citizenship, that had to go up to the very top. Well, there wasn't time to get it up to the very top in the first five days, so they kind of ignored him. And they decided, we'll send him back. Let him start in America and get admission here and all that. Do it properly from the uh, Russian embassy in Washington. So at that point, he made a suicide attempt. Now, the suicide attempt, we discovered as we interviewed the doctors, and then was that it was, it was a superficial attempt. It was a phony suicide attempt. He slashed one wrist, but he didn't slash it very deeply, not deeply enough to kill himself. So they now they couldn't send him back. They're not going to send back somebody who just tried to commit suicide. It would have been a scandal in the international press since America already had been full of notices about how this Marine had defected. So what were they going to do? They put him in a hotel in Moscow, uh, the Metropole, I believe, and they waited and they decided what to do with him, and months went by. And before long, in the first week or two after they sent him back, he went over to the American Embassy, and he turned in his passport, or said he wanted to, and that he wanted to take up Russian citizenship. And that made them even more suspicious, because they had bugs planted in all the walls. And there he was yelling at the uh, consul, Richard Snyder, I want to turn in my passport. I, I want to become a Russian citizen. And their attitude was, why is he yelling? If he knows anything at all, he knows, particularly if he's a CIA man, he knows that we have bugs on the wall. And so why is he doing all this to get our attention? It makes no sense at all. A man who seriously wanted to become a Russian citizen would speak quietly at this point. He wouldn't yell. Yelling is a way of indicating he's false. So given all these... Uh, permutations for the KGB, they just debated and debated, what do we do with him? It's possible he's sincere. If he's sincere, and don't forget this was still uh, 1959, early 1960, in those days they had much more optimism about what was going to happen to their system. They felt things would improve and they'd end up with a, you know, a fine system and eventually the entire world might be communist. In those days they didn't see themselves as a, as a hopeless, dwindling empire. So they felt it would be terrible if they don't uh, accept him, if he's sincere. But if he's not sincere, what do they do with him? What do they do with him? What do they do with him? It became an obsessive question. Because what sort of CIA man is it? That the CIA sends over a man who commits suicide on his fourth, fifth day in the country? This is ridiculous. Unless maybe he's a new kind of CIA animal. Maybe they send over an oddball to see how we'll react. And so they can study our processes. Well, in that case, you know the old saying, hit me, said the sadist. I, I won't, uh, hit me, said the masochist. 
I won't, said the sadist. So what do they do? They decide to observe him. All right, well, at that point, we started arguing with them. We started saying, well, weren't you interested in his military information? He was a Marine who had all this radar information. Uh, weren't you interested in that? And they said, no, our, our sources in Japan, where he served, were excellent. We knew everything he knew. I said, no, no, that's not good enough. You know, I know enough about espionage to know that any little bit of new information you get can always be a possibly of great value. Why didn't you debrief him? It's very hard to believe you didn't debrief him. And they said, well, it's possible that we lost, because with the KGB, if your question was good enough, they'd give you a fair reply. They said, well, it's possible we might have lost a little bit of information here or there, and it might even have been valuable. But we had to weigh the possibilities and the probabilities, and from our point of view, we didn't want to take any overt action. We were tempted to, but we wouldn't. And so we just observed them. And the next question is, where do we observe them? Moscow's a dangerous city. There are all sorts of foreigners there. He can get into trouble. We can have a scandal. He can commit suicide again, this or that. Let's send him to Minsk. That's a quiet city where the level of living is pretty good for us. How far from Moscow? Oh, it's about 400 miles, 450 miles, a little south of uh, Moscow and east, near, near the Polish border. And we have very good uh, KGB there because they're used to doing all sorts of border investigations with English spies coming in, American spies coming in, people crossing the border in various ways. So they've gotten very good at detecting foreign spies. So we'll send them there and we'll observe them in Minsk. And they did. And for the next two years and four months, they observed them. And uh, very often were bored with him because he led a very quiet life. But occasionally they had great shocks because at one point he married uh, a young girl, Marina, who uh, was the niece not only of Valya, but was the niece of a colonel in the MVD, which is to the KGB as roughly as the FBI is to the CIA. How old, by the way, was both uh, Lee Oswald and Marina at that time when they got married? She was a year younger than him, and at that point when they got married, he was uh, 22, I think, 21, going on 22. Uh, they were married. They were married in April of uh, '61, and at that point, he was. Uh, his birthday was in October, so he's not yet 22. By the way, we've got some fresh tea for you there. If you're oh, thank you, thirsty. wonderful. Um, he he committed the assassination, or the I mean, the he allegedly assassinated President Kennedy when he was 24 years old. Yes. Correct? Okay. Um, and, and and by the way. Uh, I know we're jumping to the end of this. Uh, time goes by so fast on these things. In the, what was your conclusion after all this about did he? Well, the two halves of the conclusion. Originally, I was going to do a book about Oswald in Minsk. In fact, that was the working title. But by the time I finished that, and that's half the book, I felt that I'd learned a lot about him. I had some sense of what he was like in a room. He was like a character in a novel to me. But I had no idea at all of whether he was innocent or guilty. The feeling generally was, uh, I remember at my house, which published Case Closed by Gerald Posner, the feeling was they were all very pro-Posner at that point. Then they read this and they said, golly, uh, it seems like he didn't do it. He seems innocent. Well, because he was very, most of the Russians saw him as rather passive and gentle, and, uh, and particularly the ones in Minsk, and, you know, not a fellow to really do big things. After the assassination, very few of the Russians believed he'd done it, maybe a third of them at most. Most of them felt it was an American plot and that they'd used him because he'd lived in the Soviet Union. So I felt not satisfied with what I'd learned. And I thought I'd write a 100-page epilogue about coming back to America. And that 100-page epilogue became a 400-page uh, second volume uh, as I got into it. Because I discovered the Warren Commission report had endless uses, but they weren't the ones which, for which people had originally discarded the Warren Commission report. It's really no good at all uh, considering the effort that was put in as an investigation because while it accumulated a huge amount of material, there's very little interpretation, very few leads were followed up. Uh, it, I speak of it as, you, you know, its value as an investigative force was equal to a dead whale decomposing on a beach. But there, were wonderful, there was wonderful material in the Warren Report. You go through and find all kinds of little short stories and extraordinary little moments, and you get a picture of the time in the Warren Report that's really uh, historians in 200 years will be going through that to get an idea of what life was like in America in that period. You say there were 26 volumes. Yeah. And when you say volumes, how big a... Well, you're dealing with, you're dealing with very small print. 
and a great many lines to a page, maybe 60, 70 lines to, 60 lines to a page, and 500 page volumes. And uh, the first 13 or 14, as I recall, are testimonies, and then the remaining volumes are evidence of various sorts, documents. How, how much of that have you read? I probably read a, I, well, I'm familiar with just about all of it, but I probably read more than half of it. I had time to it. I had to get the pages enlarged to read it. The type was so small. It's not a comfortable book to read, uh, uh, which is why so few people ever looked at it. Is it uh, where is it available? Oh, I think you can get it from the government uh, or, or in a library. And in this book, you've got transcripts from that. Some of the some of the Warren Report stuff is in here, uh, and then the interviews that you talked about. You there's some narrative, but there's also some KGB transcripts. Yes. Where does that come from? And what is it about? Well, they promised us the file, and um, we got a quick look at the entire Oswald file, uh, the way um, uh, Nightline got a quick look at the file. <coughs> and then they promised to deliver it all to us, and we, we had a team there to work with it and translate these 600 pages of, of the file. But troubles began in Belarus, which is the Stasi in East Germany uh, got into a great deal of trouble with their sources who'd been exposed. And so people that you thought were your good friend had been informing on you for 10 years, 15 years, and they were all hell broke loose in East Germany over that. So in Belarus, people who worked for the KGB began saying, what are you doing giving away these files? You've got to stop that or we'll have trouble here. So then we got into a back and forth with the KGB where they'd give us something or wouldn't give us something we never knew and we'd work from day to day. And, spent the spare time, because we accumulated spare time, interviewing other people. And a while after a while I could figure out who a lot of the sources were. And finally, what they did generally is they restricted most of the material to uh, stuff that involved Oswald alone, like surveillance of Oswald, or Oswald and Marina. And we had pretty thorough files on Oswald and Marina and their conversations at home. You spent five days with Marina? Yeah, in Texas. Where is she now? In Texas. Where? She lives in Texas with her former husband. With her former husband? Yes. Well, they have a child. They were married for about 10 years, got divorced, and then decided they wanted to live together again, but uh, weren't, I guess, for whatever reason, decided they did not want to necessarily get married again. What town does she live in? Oh, I don't know if she wants it revealed. It's within the Dallas area. It's in 100 miles of Dallas. Why did she talk to you? Oh, once again, the um, ubiquitous Mr. Schiller, he gets things done. <laughs> I don't know. If I had to go out and get her for an interview, I wouldn't have succeeded. He had worked with her earlier. She knew him, and I think she trusted him to a degree. She's a little frustrated, though, isn't she, when you, in the interview? Frustrated. Yeah, well, well, we had, she, one of the things that was fascinating with Marina is I came in expecting to meet a woman who was fairly devious. And uh, what I discovered is that she really, the truth is terribly important to her. She had that reputation for years after the assassination that she was a liar. But nobody ever, tr tr ever attempted to put it in context. There she was, a young woman, unhappily married, whose husband's been accused of killing the president. She's a Russian. She lives in this great terror that some wagon's going to scoop her up overnight and liquidate her. She's used to, you know, if it happened in Russia, my God, what would have happened to her? Uh, these powerful people from the Secret Service and the FBI are all talking to her. So she feels now that she was brainwashed then, and she was just eager to serve them at that point. She was terrified, and she was doing her best to tell them what she felt they wanted to hear. So her story kept changing and changing and changing in its details. And the general attitude is we're dealing with a total liar. But in fact, I found her very truthful. Her memory is almost shattered by the media bombardments of 30 years and the shock of living with it and so forth. So her recollection of details is not that good. How old is she now? Would well, she's thir was 30 years plus, uh, uh, at the time we interviewed her, was 63. So she was, I think she was about 19 when, she, maybe she was 52. What she look like? Well, she has, she has extraordinary blue eyes. Uh, absolutely beautiful, look like diamonds, and that was always her. She was a very good-looking young girl, quite attractive. Now she's 52 years old. She's had a tough life, so you might say some of that shows. She's very small, thin, How uh, are bent children? over with guilt. Uh, I mean, she's su suffused with big guilt as Russians. Russians are great at two things: compassion and guilt. If you're going to generalize about a people, and uh, they live with guilt. I mean, that Russian Orthodox Church is. You ever go into one, you can see the intense guilt and devotion of people who are in it. And she had a very religious grandmother. 
So she, she's not religious herself, but she grew up in this, in the deep grip of responsibility, of spiritual responsibility. Very interesting woman that way. Uh, how's her English? It's very fast, very fluent, and grammatically nothing remarkable. It's, uh, her mind works very quickly. She's quite bright, but her, her syntax uh, leaves quite a bit. How old are her children? Well, I don't know. Uh, she wouldn't want us to meet her children, but I, I could reconstruct that. Uh, the first child was born in 62, so the oldest child was 31 at that point, 33 today. Does she go by the name Oswald, or did she take her... No, it's her husband's name, Porter. M Marina Oswald Porter. Now, at one point, and I don't have it, I'm not turned to the page, I think I remember you, her saying something, in fact, you wouldn't ask Jacqueline Kennedy these kind of questions. Yeah. What was that about? Oh, we were asking her about... You see, one of the things that happened to her was that in, uh, in Minsk, there was a tremendous amount of gossip about her life in Leningrad. So we were following on, on the trail of it, so to speak, and to us it was very important whether she'd had a wild life in Leningrad that was truly wild, you know, because there was very ugly talk about her life there, or whether it had been exaggerated, because we felt that had an would have an enormous effect upon the marriage, since unconsciously Oswald would be reacting to that in the most intense fashion. So we did pursue her on that. It was very painful and difficult and ugly for her, the questioning. But what, we, what I finally arrived at is that she'd had a mildly wild life in Leningrad, the way any average American girl of 17 who's very good looking and doesn't have a happy home life is going to have. There was nothing extraordinary about it. I remember she said at one point, all right, I'm going to give you the key to my life. And she told us about how she was raped once when she was uh, 17. And I looked at her in amazement and I said, that's the key. It's, it, it's a wax key. Because it was a story that uh, 100,000 American girls could have told. You know, I was expecting some incredible uh, revelation, you know, you know, of incredibly sordid life. And this was much smaller. But I realized that her guilt is so enormous, because she was brought up very properly by a grandmother. Her guilt was so intense that she uh, uh, saw the, the few things, the few small things she'd done in Leningrad as incredibly evil and bad. And she felt she got married on false pretenses because she hadn't told Oswald that. So in effect, what we were looking for were the psychological realities of that marriage, which, was, which was an unstable, unhappy marriage where they were half in love with one another and half absolutely at odds all the time. And then a lot of these transcripts that you show from Minsk have them arguing constantly in their bedroom and all yeah. that. And one interesting thing I remember is that uh, the, the KGB shut down at 11 o'clock at night. The, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the transcription <laughs> service. Well, good cops, they want to get to sleep, they want to go home, see their family, eat, get a little sleep. It's a tough job. You've got to sit in a small room, look through a peephole. The Russians were very proud that in 1960 they discovered fiber optics, and they used to have a hole they'd put in a wall that was about the size of a pinpoint. And in it they'd insert a fiber optic, and I suppose they had a lens on the other side, so they could see what was going on in the other room. And I suppose they heard through various bugs. I mean, they could see what was going on between those two people in that room. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, how long was it going? If they were going to sleep, why should the transcriber stay up all night? So, now, we used to ask them about that. We used to say, well, you know, if you thought it was that important, why did you quit at 11 o'clock? And the KGB fellow that we were talking to the most on this, who was the, we'll called the developer, he was the analyst in charge of the entire situation, and he said, well, you know, and there were various reasons. One was the budget. The budget couldn't pay for 24-hour surveillance. The FBI runs into the same problem all the time. How important is the case? How, much are you willing, how many funds are you willing to allocate to that? Because you're not going to have it for something else. In the second, we didn't get to the conclusion of the second part of this. Uh, in the end, again, you, you, you reached the conclusion after Minsk about Lee Harvey Oswald. What did you reach at the end? The conclusion I reached is that he probably did it. I felt there was a 75% certainty that it was a lone gunman. But I hedged it about with, with a great many qualifications because the first of which was that if I'd been a lawyer, I could have gotten them off. Or any good lawyer could have gotten them off because there was so much confusion in the evidence and it's so very hard to be able to state definitively that he did it. There's an awful lot of evidence that would have him doing it, but there's an awful lot that wouldn't. And they're always the great questions. How did he get from the sixth floor to the second floor without breathing heavily in 60 seconds? Uh, how could he, who was a bad shot, have shot so successfully? and skillfully. And there are all these, these questions. How could that magic bullet have done what it did, you know, and 
so forth. These questions, I don't pretend to answer them, and it's quite possible that, but if I'd been a lawyer, as I say, I could have used those questions to, to um, win over a jury. I felt finally that he did it because it was the logic of his life. And, but you have to read the book to know what I'm talking about. Uh, how many books have you written? I don't know, 25, 26, 27, depends what you call books. A couple of them were put together out of other books, so let's call it 25. What was the bestseller of all those? Of all of them? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe The Naked and the Dead, maybe The Executioner Song. And wh where does this book go on your list as, uh, you know, experiences in your life? How important is this one? This is a, a book like Harlot's Ghost, which was one before this, is more important to me because it was an imaginative work where I had to make it all up myself practically. Ancient Evenings is an example like that, where I really had to make it up. This book, I had the help of, um, put it this way, the writing of this uh, was less exciting and less scary than when you're making it up from day to day. Because when you're making it up each day, and let's say you're going to go in on a given morning, and you're going to start writing about the Battle of Kadesh in Egypt, 1000 BC, and you want to write the greatest battle scene since Tolstoy, you're scared that morning when you walk in. It, it, you're not comfortable at all. But in this, a lot of the writing was done in the interviews. You see, in the interviews, you're, it's almost as if you're shaping the book in your mind, and as it proceeds, it changes. It's analogous to what you feel when you're talking to me. As I talk, you were going to go in one direction, but now you're going to go in another because it, something came up that's interesting. And in a certain sense, that's the way this book got written. By the time we'd done all the interviews, you might say the book was half written for me. Larry Schiller um, is your partner in this. But there's a Howard Schiller that uh, designed this son. cover. His son did the jacket. Nice jacket. And what's, who's, what house is this? That house is the house that Oswald lived in on Neely Street in Dallas in uh, 19, in early 63, uh, months before, t eight, ten months before uh, the assassination of President Kennedy. And it was in that house that he uh, set out to kill, uh, in, in my belief, uh, General Walker. and took the shot at General Walker. Who was General Walker? General Walker was an extreme right winger, virtually a fascist, who uh, was one of the heads of the John Birch Society. And Oswald believed that uh, he was going to be a future Hitler. And he thought it would be a virtuous act to shoot him. When had you gathered all the information you needed to begin writing? It doesn't work that way. What happens is I get into a book before I've accumulated all the information. I had all the information about Russia that I needed, 95% of it. But when I came home and started writing Oswald in Minsk, but by the time I finished that, as I say, I thought I was going to add 100 pages about Oswald in America. That 100 pages became four or 500 pages because I began doing new research. And as I did, I'd stop writing for long periods and do the new research. And so the second half of the book took as long as the first half, easily. And, uh, uh, and then you finish it, and then you go over it, and then you start to shape it more and more and more. Once you know what you have, you shape it more. So the writing of this book, you might say, was easier than the writing of other books I've done. Right. On the other hand, it was, I got more out of it. I'm, I'm fond of the book because I had this extraordinary experience of living in Minsk. You know, I, I just felt, well, hell, I'm in my late 60s. My, I, turned, I had my 70th birthday in Moscow a couple of years ago, and I just felt, I'm not dead yet. You, you, know, you know, this is not so bad. Uh, uh, but I can live in a strange place and get a lot out of it, and I'm working hard, and, and all that was fun. Where do you write? I've got a little studio in Brooklyn, a couple of blocks from my house. No telephone, nothing there. So I go there, and when I go there, the only thing I ever do there is work. So it's wonderful. I'm like a dog with a conditioned reflex. No television. No television, no telephone, nothing. No radio. Not even, not even my wife wants me to get a portable telephone. I refuse. Because? Well, she says, what if you get sick over there? No, but I mean, because you have no telephone because, what's the reason for that? I don't want to be tempted. There's an old uh, Jewish belief that you uh, build a fence around an impulse, and then that's not good enough. You build a fence around the fence. So, no telephone. <laughs> and, and what do you write with, or how do you write? I write longhand with a pencil. And uh, I've got a marvelous assistant named Judith McNally, and she will type it up the next day, and then I go over it. And since at my age you begin to forget things very easily, it's marvelous because I hardly remember what I wrote the day before. Now it's typed and it's as if someone else wrote it. And I'll go through it and I'll say, who was the idiot who wrote that stupid sentence? And I'll fix it up and uh, I'll edit it. And as I edit it, uh, I, I give it back to her and she sends it back each day. So it's as if I have my own word. 
I don't work with a word processor, but I do have the benefits of one. How long have you worked in this office in Brooklyn? Oh, I have to think now. This particular place I've worked in for about 10 years now, uh, maybe 12. I used to work at home. I used to have a little eerie up at the top of my, our apartment. Up on, we've got an odd apartment, and there was a little cubbyhole up on the top with a wonderful view of the harbor. So I used to work up there. What time of day do you write? Oh, generally I'll start late in the morning. And if we're not going out that evening, I won't finish till 9 o'clock at night. So it plays hell with our social life. Do you have any writer's block uh, ever? No, but I think I may have had a certain sense of how to avoid it. Uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. It, it's, a, it's a foolish author who'll brag they've never had writer's block. How do you avoid it? Well, let, let me amend what I'm saying. When I was younger, I had years when I used to wonder whether I'd ever write another book. And I didn't, wouldn't write for six months at a time. But since I wasn't on anything, I didn't see it as writer's block. Or I had a couple of books I started and didn't know how to go on with, and I dropped them. But I never, I never called it writer's block because it didn't feel that way. Um, and I think what happens is there's something deep in the unconscious that says to you, you can go ahead with this. This book can be written. There's certain books you can't write. If you're writing about a terribly charged emotional material and you're not ready to, to live with it, then I think, I think you're not writing anymore. You're engaged in a transaction with yourself that probably is analogous to a patient with a psychoanalyst. You know, where psychoanalysts are always talking about how they can't get patients to deliver certain sorts of obvious material because they won't face it. So I think a writer's block probably is rated that. But, you know, all writers have certain strengths and weaknesses, and I think one of my strengths has been that I've been able to avoid writer's block. It, it, isn't, it isn't a preoccupation of mine. What I'm concerned with is how good is it going to be. Where did you grow up? Uh, in Brooklyn. I was born in New Jersey, but I grew up in Brooklyn. Then I went to Harvard. Talk about, talk about um, questions of identity. I didn't even know. I didn't even know that problem existed. That you had to search for your own identity. But going from Brooklyn to Harvard in those years, uh, back in the late '30s, early '40s, uh, was quite a change. Did, when did you first get interested in politics? Oh, probably in 1948, after The Naked and the Dead came out, because I was for Henry Wallace. And so I used to speak for him a little bit. What did that mean, I was for Henry Wallace? Well, he had the Progressive Party. I guess, yeah, we have to talk to people who were born long after that. In 1948, Henry Wallace ran for president. He was a left-wing candidate. Very, very roughly analogous. Let's say if, if Jesse Jackson were to run as a third-party candidate, the, it was called the Progressive Party in those days. It was about as far to the left as uh, Jesse Jackson would be. Uh, Wallace was, of course, white. He would have been a former Secretary of Agriculture. Couldn't be more different from Jesse Jackson in any way. Uh, I mean, two men are poles apart. The only parallel would be that the political positions would be about the uh, same in terms of geography, topography. But uh, that got me interested, and then I've always been interested more or less one way or another for all these years. Where are you on the political spectrum today? I am what I call a left conservative. And uh, what I... Uh, I can find it in a variety of ways, but uh, maybe if we talk about politics, if we're going to, um, it'll come out. Uh, do, you, do you have anybody in, in, uh, in politics today that you admire? Anybody, any human being that's running for an office or wants to run? No, no, not at the moment. I wish Mario Cuomo would, uh, would run. I'd, I'd be excited by that. Wish he'd run for president, at least in the New Hampshire primary. Because I think if nothing else, uh, I'm a Democrat, but I think... Uh, I think Bill Clinton needs a shock or two. He's, he's, he's wib-wobbling in the center. He, in fact, I, I have a... Uh, I see him, really, if I got a word for him now. You know, Gore Vidal used to call Eisenhower the golfer. So uh, I would call Bill Clinton the Dauphin. We need a nice 17-year-old peasant girl named Joan of Arc to come to him and say, President Clinton, you must save the nation. He's not going to save it by uh, doing what he's doing now. Uh, you said something real early in this talk, uh, chat, about Norman Podorz. He so, used to be... We used to be great friends. And, and he's just retired as editor of Commentary Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, what's that, the magazine of the American Jewish Committee? Or, mm -hmm. um, why did you used to be friends? I mean, he's a neo Oh, for a variety of reasons. And one of them is the most basic reason of friendship. We got along, we enjoyed each other's company, and so forth and so on. And politically, we were, we were fairly close in those days. And then he moved way over to the right. Which wouldn't have bothered me in a funny way. I've always felt it's, it's obscene if politics gets in the way of friendship. Friendship should be more important than politics. 
But in fact, uh, I'll lay the blame on Norman. He really didn't want to have anything to do with me. Uh, my vanity tells me is he didn't want to have to argue with me day, night after night after night, or his newfound security on the right might have been weakened just a touch. But that's my vanity. Uh, at any event, uh, uh, he, he uh, pulled himself away from me. Today, what, what sparked you to talk politics? What issue? Almost anything. I really, um, I mean, one pleasure about being on this program is that there's no commercial. I've got to tell you. Because <coughs> well, I think really that when you start to talk about the violence of television, the violence of television breeds, I don't think it's that much to do with the scenarios. I think what it has to do with much, much more is if you have young, violent kids and they're watching something, they get interested in it, which is very hard for violent people to get interested in something outside themselves, because most violent people are obsessed all the time with themselves and their inner state. But finally, they get interested, let's say, in a little story they're watching on TV, and then boom, comes the commercial. Now they're violent. They've been interrupted. Don't interrupt a violent man, you know? So this goes on, and then you take five-year-olds who just have sweet, sensate little brains, and they're being interrupted all the time. They lose a sense of concentration. And, and this is, 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 that gets me furious. You know, my kids, my poor kids, they grow up with me, and they see me screaming at the television set when the commercial comes on. But How many kids? I have nine. They're not all there at the same time. All from the same wife? No, 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 no. I've been married a few times. How many times have you been married? Six times. Would you do that over again? Oh, maybe. Th I can't answer that question without getting in endless trouble all over the place. Uh, how old are the kids? I think finally if you get married seriously, uh, there's no, um, that's your life. You know, there's certain people who lived in six countries o over their lifetime. That's their life. They can say my eight years in Turkey were fascinating. Uh, I love the uh, 15 years I had in Paris. I think a marriage is like that. It's a culture. And uh, I'd hate to say, after 15 years of living in Paris, I hate France and everything about it. You know, in other words, I think when you've had a marriage, since you were living in a culture, because there's no such thing as a woman who is not a deep culture. If anyone out there who's married to a woman who's not a deep culture may be in the wrong marriage. How would you rate your life? How would I rate my life? No, rate your life. Have you uh, done what you wanted to do? What's... Up and down, in and out, uh, lucky, unlucky, but finally I can't, I can't complain. But, uh, you know, I, I think, I think if, if you can get to the point where you're not suffused with self-pity, then you've probably done 51 things right to every 49 things you did wrong. I think self-pity is the ultimate spiritual disease because it, it, it's, it, it's anger against God, if you will. And um, th that means there's no respect for God. And the moment there's no respect for God, we're in a lot of trouble. Now you see why I call myself a left conservative. On the one hand, I think everybody ought to have a bed at night and enough to eat, enough medical care. I think it's obscene if you have a very wealthy people and very poor people. There's got to be a safety net, a true safety net. Uh, the rich people would sleep a lot better if everybody who was poor was taken care of. And if they don't work, that's their sin. That's their hard life. You can't sit in judgment on them. Uh, I remember when I ran for mayor in uh, 69, at one point, some people said to Breslin and myself, to James Breslin and myself, Jimmy Breslin and I ran for, I was running for mayor, he was running for president of city council in New York in a primary. And our campaign was halfway interesting. We were one of five sets of candidates. And uh, somebody said, you know, if you could improve your welfare program, you'd, uh, if you could come up with an interesting welfare program, you might get somewhere really. People would start taking it more seriously. So we decided we'd go up and pay some visits, to some black people up in, Harlem and talk about welfare. And our people found somebody to talk to, a couple of women who headed up a very important uh, uh, black welfare program there. And we went up, way up to Harlem and went to visit them. And there were two big, strong black women sitting at a desk and uh, in a shabby little room. And we thought we'd say, now, see here, madam, we can help each other, let us discuss this. And instead what happened is one of them started talking she said, Mrs. Rich Buck's over on Fifth Avenue. She says, I got a Cadillac, and uh, I, I'm getting welfare, and I'm riding around a Cadillac, and how dare I? And I say, and I cannot use the next word she used on television, she said, blanker. Uh, my Cadillac is eight years old, and it's in the garage all the time, and she drives around a Rolls Royce with a chauffeur. And then another woman, the other woman said, and Mrs. So-and-so over on Park Avenue, she says, I got... 
seven illegitimate children and I'm getting money for all of them and I say, blanker. I had those children, she had her seven abortions. And they, one of them looked at us and said, we want our share of the waste. And I thought, well, it has to be said uh, that uh, there's <laughs> something to their argument. We nodded and said, thank you, thank you ladies, and we left, we had no welfare program. The, the point behind it, I think, is that so long as there's a sense of huge waste at the top, there's no way the people at the bottom are going to say thank you, thank you for taking care of us. And finally, the, the real tragedy is not that people at the top are infuriated, the people at the bottom are not putting their shoulder to the wheel. The real tragedy is when people at the bottom can't work and don't work, they're in misery, they're in spiritual misery. And it affects their children. It goes on generation after generation, as it has in England. And, and uh, being on the dole is no fun. So in that sense, I'm left. I think I'm a left winger. I think, I think we've got to have a safety net that's profound and let's stop worrying about the rich surviving. The rich always take care of themselves. We're almost out of time on Oswald's tale. After someone finishes this book off, what, what do you want them to conclude? What's, what's the... I want them to think about the Cold War and what a tragic comedy it was as personified by the life of this one man who really attempted to deal with the Cold War. He went over to the uh, Soviet Union because he was in protest of what was going on in America. He got dissatisfied with the Soviet Union, he came back to America, now he was dissatisfied with both countries. But he lived at the bottom and he really saw the ironies of both countries and the way there was, that, that there was just no need for that Cold War. They both were horrible systems as far as he was concerned. So I want them just to ponder that. that, that and. Uh, Ideally, if they find it interesting enough, what do I also want? I'd like those who've never read another book of mine to read another book. Is there a next book? There better be a next book. Fiction, nonfiction? I think I'm going to try to do the second volume of Harlot's Ghost. Norman Mailer, author of Oswald's Tale, an American Mystery. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lyon. Norman Mailer is author of Oswald's Tale, an American Mystery. It's published by Random House, on the web at randomhouse.com. Next week on On.